you're a doctor and so you are seeing patients and um, no doubt have a lot of compassion and love for your patients. <laughs> Some of the anecdotal stories of people adopting these animal-based low-carbohydrate diets, um, I mean, it leaves me empathizing with, with them because they report having some type of autoimmune condition or inflammatory condition with debilitating symptoms and then feeling significantly better. How do, how do we kind of reconcile that? And if you had someone in front of you that was going through that and was explaining to you the benefits that they have experienced from eliminating plant foods, all of the foods that that you're advocating for, um, but is open-minded and, and is also considering their long-term health, how would you have that conversation? I think, well, it, it leads to two different thoughts here. One is that some people don't thrive on a plant-based diet, and the question is why. And whatever their genetics or individual needs are, we try to ascertain what those needs are and meet them. And even if it's necessary for some people to eat some animal products, then I would do so to benefit their, their long-term outcome or their outcome for them and not hold to a philosophical viewpoint of what's better for me or somebody else. I'd still want to do what's best for them if they have that need, number one. Um, but we try to um, utilize as little of the animal product as possible as they need to get enough of certain thing that they may require, which is usually slow the digestive process down and get more zinc and you know whatever the, re the things they're getting more iron, whatever thing they, they need. Um, some people are like like um, you know hypomethylators or something or whatever. So we they might not thrive on a totally plant based diet. And I'd still say there's so many beneficial factors in the plant foods that are important for human immune system and longevity, we'd still try to incorporate as much plant food as possible and as little animal product as possible to have them thrive. Now you have a person that's the other direction where they seem to thrive better almost all animal products when they take all the plants out. And then the question is, well, what was there in the plant foods that were causing an excitation of their immune system? Because it probably wasn't everything, they were, every plant food they were eating. It was probably certain things they were sensitive to. So then the question would be to how to determine what foods they can eat from the plant kingdom that would be safe for them and still maintain the benefits. And then to see if we can improve their digestive health and their gut health so they can tolerate more and more of these foods. And even allergies, we've even let people recover from allergies over time. And we sometimes use oral tolerance therapy once they're eating healthy for a long enough period of time. But we can't even use oral tolerance to improve their allergies until they're able to sustain a, a, a high exposure, like you're saying, to polyphenols and antioxidants for a long period of time to improve immune function, that now we can use to have them be, become less allergic or, or sensitive to certain foods. So one, we're going to look at what nutritional deficiencies and what individual variabilities they have that make them different from a person that doesn't have some of this genetic feature. And, and also, what are the particular animal products that might be tr um, sensitized and uh, handling or digesting well? and try to design a diet that's best for them without excluding throwing away every good thing that they could be eating that could help their longevity just because they do better when they cut out beans or nuts or some other food like that. So it's complicated, you know, but it's most often, it's, that's not most often the case. Those are very rare instances. It's most often the case that people can make a recovery from their autoimmune condition, conditions eating healthy plant-based diets and they do better off without animal products which create more inflammatory substances in their body. It's more often the other case, but still individuals are different enough that you have to be flexible enough to do what works for a person. What kind of results have you seen with patients that have certain autoimmune conditions who have been able to successfully adopt a nutritarian diet? Yeah, I see predictable um, responses. Psoriasis goes away, lupus, asthma, connective tissue disorders, rheumatoid arthritis, my experience is that it's very rare that I can't have a person recover completely from their autoimmune disease. So much so that I've had multiple individuals who had lupus. One particular teenager had a creatinine of 4.2, which represents significant loss of kidney function. And she was on the national renal transplant list waiting for a new kidney. And by changing her diet, she was able to um, get well again and have her kidney function return to normal, which even shocked me. So I've seen some very, very advanced cases and severe cases of people who've made complete recoveries through excellent nutrition, you know, but it doesn't mean I won't continue to modify things to try to get people if I need to be, need to. I don't have a standard one size fits all advice. 
when I think about this and the anecdotes that you can hear on, on both sides, I think about what's the overlap here? And one thing that just pops up is both diets tend to be devoid of ultra processed foods and can help people lose weight, at least in the short term. Absolutely. And it's a lot of times, um, as you know, fasting has a huge history on resolving autoimmune inflammatory conditions. And I don't even fast people right away with asthma, let's say, for example, because they're on steroids or a person with, uh, you know, on Imuran or immunosuppressive drug is not even safe to fast them. They may require six months of eating healthfully to slowly wean down off their medications. And then I might put them on a caloric re a fast or a caloric restricted period. So their body, like it, it restricts the hyperactivity of the immune system to allow the body to calm down enough to get back to normal function again. Is that a shortening of like a daily eating window or is that a more like a weekend fasting? How do you like to do that? protocol it's really very you know and don't forget i'm not recommending or utilizing sure. fasting for weight loss this is for people with autoimmune conditions or an asthmatic coming off their steroids or a lupus patient could into facilitate a, re a remission in these cases i'm traditionally fasting them approximately 10 days of just water i'm taking but i'm not doing it till their health improves enough so they can sustain that it's by that prolonged period of not eating for seven to 10 days, then going back to having moderate caloric restriction again, it could curtail the hyperactivity of the immune system so they're not attacking their own body. And we, what we're trying to do is facilitate a remission. Is that something you do, you facilitate in person down at your retreat, or is that done uh, like remotely with patients? No, I don't usually do it remotely with patients, but I do have people who have, who have a history of Crohn's or, col or ulcerative colitis who fast two or three days a month or two or three days every six weeks as a means of maintaining remission from their um, inf pro um, inflammatory bowel disease. Mm -hmm. So some of these people have gotten off medications. They're no longer putting blood in their stool. They're, they're, they've improved their digestive capacity to the point, but they're still somewhat um, more susceptible to developing a flare down the road. So by may, even they're off medication, they're doing well. We sometimes have them fast regularly to have to improve their digestive capacity. What about cardiometabolic conditions? So people that are coming to you with maybe a history of heart disease, maybe they have non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, maybe they have type two diabetes. Yeah, that's the bread and butter. Right. What are you what are you noticing in these patients when they're adopting your way of eating? Well, it varies from person to person, but generally they're off their insulin and all their type two diabetes resolves within the first few weeks or the first month. Sometimes it could take longer when a person's particularly overweight and they've taken, you know, drugs, oral hypoglycemia, you know, agents for a long time. But usually it's pretty quick. How much and weight would that someone typically lose in that first month? Well, the average male loses about 25 pounds and the average fe overweight male and the average female loses about 15 pounds the first month. Um, but I've had, it depends on how heavy they are and how, you know, how close they are to their ideal weight. But they usually slow down after that because they lose a lot of water weight and fluid the first month. After that, they slow down to about 10 or 12 pounds a month. But I've had a lot of people lose, continue to lose 15 pounds a month. Right. And once you, once you lose 10 or 15% of body weight, a lot of people can go into remission on type, if they have type 2 diabetes, right? If they haven't had it for too long. It depends on the, the direction of travel of their weight. In other words, they're gonna, as long as they're eating calorically less food and their body is moving in the right direction, they could, their diabetes could go away. But they're still overweight. They're just losing 2 pounds or 3 pounds a week. But if they start to level their weight off at a weight that's still above their ideal weight, their diabetes can start to worsen and come back again. What I'm saying right now, I consider a nutritarian a person who's striving, eating and at their ideal weight, which is a body fat below 25% for a female, below 15% for a male, or a person who's losing weight, eating right, and moving in the direction of, the, of, of achieving their ideal weight. If they lost weight and they stabilize at a high weight, they're no longer doing the right thing and they could start to have certain symptoms come back. And if they start to gain again, even if they're at a lower weight than initial weight, the gaining process could make their, could start inflammation occurring and then insulin resistance occurring and start to get more um, inflammatory markers coming off the fat supply. And the estrogen promoting estrogen production and insulin production. Let me say, I'll give an example here, okay? A person comes into my facility and they lose 50 pounds in those first three months and they leave. They lost 50 pounds and the risk of having, and their diabetes is gone and their estrogen levels are lower, their insulin production is lower, their inflammatory markers are lower and the risk of having a heart disease or having a heart attack is a thousand times less. 
and they go on a cruise ship or they go to Vegas and pick out on the big buffet and gain 10 pounds back. In the week they've gained 10 pounds back, they're still 40 pounds down from where they were initially because they lost 50 pounds. But now that they're at a higher risk than they would have when they started at 50 pounds heavier because of the recent gain of 10 pounds, because of the direction of travel of their weight going up so fast. So your health and your inflammatory markers has to do with um, the direction of, of what your diet is and the, the weight your weight is traveling and what direction it's traveling in. Because if you start to regain weight, even if your weight is at a lower point, you still could exacerbate and worsen your condition.